Hey, good morning, everybody. How are you today? Wow, that was impressive. Let's stand up this morning as we begin our time of worship.
learned the song last week. It talks about the mercy of Jesus. Daily, daily, I surrender. Grace for today is all that I need. Surprised by your mercy, it's new. of peace, of rest, of God being our caretaker, of Jesus being our shepherd. And Jesus gives us a promise, an invitation, really, a sweet invitation in Matthew 11. It's one of my favorite passages of Scripture. And he talks to people who are, who are very worn out, right? Worn out on religion, worn out on the... On the the definition of being a human on this planet, living on a broken world. And he says, come to me. Come to me, all of you who are weary and heavy burdened, and I will give you rest. A promise, an invitation followed by that promise. And he says, take my yoke upon you, for it's easy and my burden is light. And you will find rest for your souls. And what he didn't say is that, come to me you're weary and heavy burden and I'm going to take all the things away that give you those burdens and make you labor in this life. I'm going to, I'm going to eradicate all brokenness on this planet. No, not yet. There's a day when he comes back when he brings us home where we will enter that. But he says in the midst of now, you can find rest, which is a gift for you, for your souls. So that as you walk this broken planet, as you walk as a part of humanity, still desperate for help, you can find that in me. So Jesus, thank you for your invitation. And I pray that in my own life, in our lives today, you would help us, as your followers prayed in our areas of unbelief, to trust in your goodness, to trust in your integrity, to follow through on what you promise us. And I will trust where you lead. 
I will trust when I can't see Cause morning by morning Great is your faithfulness to me I will, I will trust Jesus, faithful from generation to generation.
he's done. You split the sea so I could walk right through it. My fears were drowned in perfect love. You rescued me so I could stand and say, I am a child. left us alone, Jesus.
And God, you being so rich in mercy, when each of us in this room were dead in our trespasses and sins, you came for us. Father, you sent your son for us. And Jesus, you took on flesh and dwelt among us. You became sin for us. And for the joy that was before you, you endured the cross and all the shame and took the full weight of the wrath of God against sin in our place so that in you we might find forgiveness, in you we might find freedom, and in your life, in your defeat of death, we might find life. That is amazing grace. Where you enable us to be called sons and daughters. For that we say thank you today. We love you, Jesus. Thank you for making all of this possible, all life possible. We give you the praise. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Hey, thank you for worshiping with us. You can have a seat. Good morning, Catalyst Church. How are we doing today? My name is Andrew. I'm the youth pastor here at Catalyst Church, and I'm so glad you joined us today. Um, what I love about that song, it says, I was blind and now I see. And here at Catalyst, we're all about knowing Christ and making him known, right? Once we see, once we've been found, what are we doing, right? Knowing Christ and making him known. Um, and so if it's your first time here, I'm so glad you're here. Um, we'd love for you to stop by our Connect table on the way out and just say hi and just let us know, um, hey, I'm glad that we see you and we see you're here. Um, my shirt today, uh, I had to wake up this morning, take my mom to the airport real early, and I said, what am I going to wear today? And I looked at the calendar, May 1st, men take over May, right? So if you see me, the next five weeks, I'll be wearing this shirt, uh, which then, uh, between first and second service, the, the uh, wager got raised, and they said, how about you don't wash your shirt for five weeks? So I don't know. It's up in the air. Talk to Allie about it. We'll see. Maybe I won't. Maybe I will. I guess we'll find out week five. Uh, also, blessed May, five weeks. Who would have think, you know, short month, five weeks, I get to wear a shirt. Anyways, that's that. Uh, also, beginning of the month, we always have first Monday of the month is our thing called Seek, right? Super exciting. It's over at the Student Center at 630. And this month is focusing about praying for families, right? It's such a heart of ours here. And so we want you guys to come out as a whole family. We're going to be praying, and that's what we're going to be focusing on at that night of Seek. Um, also coming up, the men's retreat. Who signed up? Bigger question, who's not signed up? Right here, pastor on staff, not signed up. But I'm going to sign up today, uh, so it's not too late. Uh, but we're even gracious. Today's not the last day. Tomorrow's the last day. So you can take this afternoon, think about it. Uh, but it's $80. It's going to be such a great time for men 18 or old to get together and hang out. Uh, we're also taking a church van down. So if you need somewhere to drop off your car and ride down with us, we're going to be here taking a van. Uh, super awesome. Also, uh, National Day of Prayer is this Thursday. Um, super excited about it. There's a card. Um, as you walk out, you can grab it. There's three great opportunities for us to pray, right? Pray, praying is so important, right? And so it's so amazing. We live in a country where we can do this, and we live in a city that's saying this is important to do, and so we need to show up and we need to support that, right? So there's three different events, whatever fits for your family. Um, I know we're looking forward. They're doing this great thing uh, at the, the family service that night. They're going to be doing this link, uh, link paper chain, right? Um, and so there's lots of details. Look at Bittenville Praise Facebook page. It's going to get more details on what they have going. And then, not, not the least, but the most important appointment is Extreme Days, right? Uh, it is for our kids here at Catalyst. Uh, it's a great thing during the summer. I don't know what they do, but I'm excited because I get to, <laughs> yeah, I know. Uh, I get to be a part of it this year and be able to help. Uh, registration does always fill up fast. So you want to get those spots, uh, but it's open today. And then our van update, right? We've been talking about uh, getting a new church van, and I am here to tell you today that we have raised $44,000, right? Give it up for yourselves. It's so exciting to see what God's doing. Um, and so with that, will you stand with me? Um, and I would just like to encourage you guys. I know I always say, like, reach across the aisle, but it's okay to leave your aisle. I just want to let you guys know you can move around this sanctuary and say hi to somebody that you may have not said hi to before. Uh, Scott comes up. Thank you guys so much for being here.
Good morning, Catalyst. Happy May. Isn't it a great start to a month? As we wait for Daniel Tedder to sit down, we can get done with the Word of God. <laughs> He'd do it to me, that's why. So, uh, before we get started, out in the, the lobby, we have these Timothy, study of First Timothy books. They're free if you want to get one. Uh, not right now, but when you leave, you can have one. Don't, even though we're, we're doing Timothy, don't try to follow this series with this booklet because it, it's not the same. This was given to us by Fellowship Church. We just opened a new one down the road, and they graciously just gave us these to give out to you. Uh, it's a really, really good series. Um, Fellowship's really good at, at putting down a series for you to follow. So if you just want to go through Timothy, you can grab one of these. Uh, it's just another example of the body helping the body, right? We're not in competition with them. We're co-workers, laborers with them for the body of Christ. So it's, it's a great little booklet, but don't have it and try to follow me because you'll be lost. Um, so before we get into today, the next two weeks are going to be really, really good. I'm not saying today isn't, but <laughs> give you something to look forward to. Uh, next week, is uh, going to be Monica up here. Yes, Nate told me. And if you've never heard Monica speak, it, it's going to be on Mother's Day. She's really, really good speaker. Very easy to follow and understand because unlike her husband, she doesn't make up words. <laughs> you know exactly what she's saying. And then um, the week after that, they'll both be up here. So we'll get Monica two weeks in a row. And I guess that's such a blessing that they had to tone it down with me this week. So you can, you know, really build up to, to them being up here. But that's going to be really, really good. So today's uh, Paul's Apostolic Authority in the Canon of Scripture, uh, I, I'm really glad I got this one because this was, was my walk to the faith. I wanted to find out years ago, if I'm going to follow Jesus, I need to know that his words are true. And I need to know the Bible's true. And so I really just personally did a lot of research <clears throat> into the canon of Scripture and the authority of it. And, and so I, I love doing this one today because this was me. This was the path I took. So our big ideas today, first we'll, we'll see the history of Paul, uh, then Paul's authority the history of Scripture and the authority of Scripture. So it's a lot of authority today because what you're basing your life and, and your um, eternal destination on is on Scripture, right? So we need to see if it's true. And there's a lot of, especially in today's world, of trying to take away the authority of Scripture. <clears throat> First Timothy 1 tells us, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the commandment of God our Savior and the Lord Jesus Christ our hope. To Timothy, a true son in the faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and Jesus Christ our Lord. So this very first verse of 1 Timothy clearly states that Paul was the author. <clears throat> um, this was accepted for years and years and years, 1,800 years, uh, that Paul was author and he's writing to Timothy. Now, in the mid-1800s, a shift occurred, and people started to question whether Paul was actually the author. So why is that important? <clears throat> well, if Paul's not the author, then you cast doubt on the validity of Scripture. Um, and if Paul's not the author, you can't go off of his authority for the writings. But the mid-1800s experienced what we call the Restoration Movement. Now, this isn't to be confused with the Reformation movement. Two different movements. I, one is the Protestant pulling out of the Catholic Church. The Restoration movement in the 1800s was basically they were saying uh, Scripture has been diluted and has been lost and mistranslated and we're going to restore it to what it really is. And that caused a lot of, um, a lot of cults to come about in the 1800s <clears throat> because if you cast doubt on the author you put the authority of the writings into play and from there it just really went crazy uh, we have a lot of the cults that started in this movement around today um, because by questioning the validity of paul 
then you can change it to match the whims of the leader. You can change it to match whatever you want it to say. And we have leaders such as Joseph Smith that did this. He birthed Mormonism. Uh, Mary Baker Eddy, who founded Christian Science. Charles Taze Russell, the founder of Jehovah's Witnesses. All of these people questioned the validity of Scripture and then turned it into a cult that leads people away from the saving grace of Christ. That's why it's important. That's why we have to know that what we're standing on is the true Word of God. So did these people have the authority to rewrite Scripture and to add to it? Or is Paul's writing still true today? So to get to that, let's see who Paul was and where he got his authority. <clears throat> Paul uh, was originally Saul, so you'll hear him called both throughout Scriptures. He was originally Saul. He was a Greek-speaking Jew with Roman citizenship, which becomes very important later on in his life. Uh, he came from a commercial and intellectual center of Tarsus. And although we don't know the exact date of his birth, he was active as a missionary in the 40s and 50s in the first century. So we can assume he was born about the same time or a little bit after Christ, around 4 B.C. He was convert, converted to faith in Christ around 33 A.D. And he died probably in Rome around 62 or 64 A.D. Now, we know all this, and secular historians tell us this is true also. Not like we need their input, but it's nice to know that people who don't believe the Bible will tell us that these facts we know are true. <clears throat> In his childhood and youth, Paul learned how to work with his hands. 1 Corinthians 4.12 tells us that. His trade, which was tent making, he continued to practice after his conversion, and he used it uh, on his missionary journeys because it was really easy to travel with a few leather working tools, go to a new city, set up shop, make tents for people to get funds for your journey, and be able to preach the gospel at the same time. Now, up until the midpoint of his life, Paul was a member of the Pharisees. Now, the Pharisees were a religious party that emerged during the later Second Temple period. Um, and what little bit we know about Paul reflects probably the true roots of the Pharisaic movement. Pharisees believed in life after death, which was one of Paul's deepest convictions. They accepted non-biblical traditions as being about as important as the written Bible. And Paul refers to this in these traditions in Galatians 1.14. Uh, Pharisees were very careful students of the Hebrew Bible, and Paul was able to quote extensively from the Greek translation. Um, he also studied under the first century Jewish rabbi Gamaliel. He spent much of the first half of his life persecuting the new Christian movement. Uh, he refers to that several times in his writings. Paul's motivations are unknown, but they seem to have been connected to him being a Pharisee and out of his personal religious zeal. He was working very hard for what he thought God wanted. But whatever his reasons, Paul's persecutions involved traveling from town to town, synagogue to synagogue, and urging the punishment of the Jews who accepted Jesus as the Messiah. Disobedient members of synagogues were punished by some form of ostracism, kicking them out, or by a little light flogging. Not a heavy, just a light flogging, which Paul later suffered at least five times. Second Corinthians tells us that. And according to Acts... Paul began his persecutions in Jerusalem at the stoning of Stephen. And we see that in Acts 6, 8. And Stephen, full of faith and power, did great wonders and signs among the people. Then there arose some from what is called the synagogue of the freedmen, disputing with Stephen. And they were not able to resist the wisdom of the spirit by which he spoke. Acts 7, 54. And when they heard these things, they were cut to the heart. And they gnashed at him with their teeth. But he, being full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God. And Jesus, standing at the right hand of God, and said, Look, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. Then they cried out with a loud voice, stopped their ears, and ran at him with one accord. And they cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their clothes at the feet of a young man named Saul. That's where we first see Paul in the Scriptures is at the stoning of Stephen. Now from that point, Paul became a passionate 
persecutor of Jesus' followers. <clears throat> you think you're persecuted today because someone doesn't like a post you make? Paul was going around and imprisoning people. Acts 8.1 tells us Saul was consenting to Stephen's death. At that time, a great persecution arose against the church, which was at Jerusalem. And they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. And devout men carried Stephen to his barrier, burial and made great lamentation over him. But as for Saul, he made havoc of the church, entering every house and dragging off men and women, committing them to prison. He'd kick in your door. And if you were a follower of Christ, he'd drag you out in shackles and send you to prison. So, where does this murderer of Christians get the authority to become an apostle of Christ and set doctrine? Well, a funny thing happened on the way to the forum. <laughs> Paul was on his way to do his damage. And Acts 9.1 tells us, Then Saul still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked letters from him to the synagogues of Damascus, so that if he found any who were of the way, whether men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. As he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly a light shone around him from heaven. He fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? And then the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. It is hard for you to kick against the goads. So he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what do you want me to do? And the Lord said to him, Arise and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. And the men who journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice but seeing no one. Then Saul arose from the ground and when his eyes were opened, he saw no one. But they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. And he was three days without sight and neither ate nor drank. Now there was a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias. And to him the Lord said in a vision, Ananias. And he said, Here I am, Lord. And the Lord said to him, Arise and go to the street called Straight and inquire at the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus. For behold, he is praying, and in a vision he has seen a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hand on him so that he might receive his sight. And Ananias ran out right that moment to do the Lord's bidding. Oh, wait. I'm sorry. He answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man, how much harm he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priests to bind all who call on your name. But the Lord said to him, Go, for he is a chosen vessel of mine to bear my name before the Gentiles, before the kings and the children of Israel. For I will show him how many things he must suffer for my name's sake. So, apparently, Paul didn't have enough faith because he's going to suffer, right? No, we're going to suffer for his name's sake. He's going to bring us through it. But how many times do we do the same thing? Holy Spirit tells us to do something. We say, but Lord, you don't understand. You don't know what they're like. Or you don't know what this might cost me in terms of reputation or friends or job. But Lord, you don't know. See, that's the other end of the big butts we talk about here. That's the bad end of it. But Lord, like he doesn't know. He hasn't got it figured out. He hasn't seen the beginning from the end. But he went. He did what the Lord told him to do. He went his way and entered the house and laying his hands on him, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road as you came has sent me that you might receive your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately there fell from his eyes something like scales. He received his sight at once. He arose and was baptized. So when he had received food, he was strengthened. Then Saul spent some days with the disciples at Damascus. Immediately he preached the Christ in the synagogues that he is the Son of God. <clears throat> then all who heard were amazed and said, Is this not he who destroyed those who called on this name in Jerusalem and has come here for that purpose so that he might bring them bound to the chief priest? They still didn't trust him. But 
Saul increased all the more in strength and confounded the Jews who dwelt in Damascus, proving that this Jesus is the Christ. So we see here, Paul got his authority directly from Jesus. He was the last to become an apostle of Christ, which means he was appointed by Jesus in person to proclaim the faith. Then we see in Acts 11.25, the other apostles accepted Paul and his office of apostle. 25 says, Then Barnabas departed for Tarsus to seek Saul. And when he had found him, he brought him to Antioch. So it was that for a whole year they assembled with the church and taught a great many people. And the disciples were first called Christians in Antioch. Then we see in 1 Timothy 12 how Jesus uses Paul as an example of the effect of the true gospel to sinners. And I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who has enabled me because he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry. Although I was formerly a blasphemer, a persecutor, an insolent man, but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord was exceedingly abundant with faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance. That Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of who I am the chief. However, for this reason I obtained mercy that in me first Jesus Christ might show all long suffering as a pattern to those who are going to believe on him for everlasting life. Now, to the King eternal, immortal, invisible, and to God, who alone is wise, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Of the 27 books in the New Testament, 13 are attributed to Paul. And approximately half of another one, Acts of the Apostles, deals with Paul's life and work. So about half of the New Testament stems from Paul's writings or the people he influenced. Paul's major theme in all three of his epistles, 1st and 2nd Timothy and Titus, was to uphold the Word of God, the canon of scriptures. That's what we're doing here, upholding the canon. And it's very important because if you erode that base, then anything goes. Now, epistle just means a letter or a communication, a written message. So, how do we know what is the canon of Scripture? Now that we see where Paul got his authority... How do we know what is the canon that he was preaching? As a Christian, our source of authority is the Bible and only the Bible. There's no councils, no decrees, no traditions of men, uh, no proclamations, no fancy preachers, oral histories, visions, no angelic encounters, no extra revelations supersede the written Word of God. It's the Word of God. Anything comes against it, it's wrong. Throw it out. Run from it. Um, so many people, especially today, I, I think just because of the media involved, will follow man that is preaching against the Word of God. Whether they, they like him, he's charismatic, or they just don't know their Bible. There is no new revelation for the church. I'll tell you that right now. Now, you can have a personal revelation from the Holy Spirit while you're reading the Bible. But there is, no one can stand up here and say, I have a new revelation from the church that supersedes what's already been written. Run. That's from the enemy. It's closed. The canon is closed. We have what God said. Nobody else can add to it. When it comes to the matter of final authority, there is agreement between the branches with regard to the divine inspiration of the Old and New Testaments. However, the Roman Catholic and Eastern Orthodox branches use other texts as sources of authority. The Roman Catholic Church accepts the 66 books of the Old and New Testament, but they also accept the Apocrypha as being inspired of God and also consider church tradition as authoritative as the Scriptures. The Roman Catholic Church added seven books to the Old Testament at the Council of Trent in the 16th century. Eastern Orthodox also holds church tradition as equally authoritative. I've had people, I've had um, actually Catholics and atheists argue with me that Protestants took books away from the Bible. I was like, no, the, the Bible was set. In the 1500s, the Catholic Church added to it. And they added to it because it backed up some of the stuff they were teaching. So we didn't take anything away from the Bible. Stuff was added to it later on. And the Apocrypha is just, it just means it's a set of texts 
that were included in the Septuagint and the Latin Vulgate, but not in the Hebrew Bible. And it just means hidden writings or to hide away. Uh, the 14 books, if you ever see it, of the Apocrypha are Tobias, Judith, additions to Esther, Barak, Sirach, 1st and 2nd Maccabees, Ecclesiasticus, Wisdom, 1st and 2nd Estratus, Wisdom of Solomon, uh, Letter of Jeremiah, Prayer of Azaria, Susanna, that's not the old Susanna, that's just Susanna, <laughs> Bell and the Dragon, which is an addition to Daniel, and the Prayer of Manassas. Compared to the New Testament, there was much less controversy over the canon of the Old Testament. They were much closer to it. Hebrew believers recognized God's messengers and accepted their writings as inspired of God. Um, by A.D. 250, there was nearly universal agreement on the canon of the Hebrew Scripture. What was set was set. The only issue that remained was the Apocrypha, with some debate and discussion continuing still today to it. But the vast majority of Hebrew scholars considered the Apocrypha to be good historical and religious documents, but not on the same level as Hebrew Scriptures. Now, the Protestant branch believes that Scripture alone, sola scriptura, is the final authority on all matters of faith. Scripture itself tells us that it is complete and it is the final authority. 2 Timothy 3.16 says, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. 2 Peter 1.20 says, Knowing this first, no Prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation, for prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. Deuteronomy 4.2, You shall not add to the word which I commanded you, nor take from it, that you may keep the commandments of the Lord your God which I command you. In Revelation 22.18, For I testify to everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book, if anyone adds to these things, God will take to him the plagues that are written in this book. If anyone takes away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part from the book of life, from the holy city, and from the things which are written from this book. So any message that purports to be from God must agree with the message already brought by Jesus in fulfillment of the Old Testament, like Luke 24, 27 says. And beginning at Moses and all the prophets... He expounded to them and all the scriptures the things concerning himself. You don't need anything extra. 2 Corinthians 11.4 says, For if he who comes preaches another Jesus whom we have not preached, or if you receive a different spirit which you have not received, or a different gospel which you have not accepted, you may well put up with it. For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into apostles of Christ. And no wonder, for Satan himself transforms himself into an angel of light. Therefore it is no great thing if his ministers also transform themselves into ministers of righteousness, whose end will be according to their works. You know, it's funny that he mentions uh, an angel of light. Two of the biggest cults in the world and two of the largest religions were started by men who were visited by an angel of light. Joseph Smith in the Mormon church and Muhammad in the Islam church. Both of them, angels of light. And it says very clearly, Satan transforms himself into an angel of light. And it tells you not to put up with it. Don't, if someone preaches to you something that has not been preached from this book or preaches a different Jesus... Don't put up with it or you very well may fall into it. And that's where a lot of Christians have gone. Either they don't know their Bible so they believe falsehoods or they know their Bible but, boy, that sounds a lot like how I want to live my life and it gives me permission to do things that go against the Bible. So you know what? That must be true. You heap up preachers that will tickle your ears instead of giving you the truth. And you'll fall into these falsehoods from it. That's why this is so very, very important. You need to know what the Word of God says and why it's authoritative. Because it is how we are to live our lives. Now, you don't have to follow it. You can run off and do what you want to do. 
But don't go live like you want to live and then say the Bible says that's okay. I mean, that's silly. You can't, you can't say Nate puts a list of rules for catalyst in the hallway and you say, oh, I like one, two, three, four, five, ooh, but number seven. I don't think Nate really wrote that one. Even though his name's signed to the bottom and it's got a smiling face there imposed on it, I don't think Nate wrote number seven because I don't like to live that way. I want to live this way. Well, it's the same thing we do with the Bible. You can't pick and choose. Either it's all true or none of it's true. And if you're going to say you're placing your faith on the canon of Scripture, then it's all true. And I'll, I'll get to, to points later about contradictions and stuff. But that's why it's so important. First of all, you need to know the, the Bible yourself. Don't rely on us. I've said it over and over. We'll misspeak. We might say something wrong. Uh, we wouldn't mislead you intentionally. But how would you know if you don't know your Bible? So many people are getting sucked in to living their best life now because they don't know that the guy that's telling them that knows absolutely nothing about the Lord, at least from what he's preaching. You have to know your Bible. You, you can get platitudes and feel-good messages from anybody out there in the world. But if you're going to live your life by your Bible, you have to know what it says. The canon is the list of authoritative books that make up the New Testament. Now, there were a lot of other early Christian documents. I'm going over a lot of arguments that people use. And some of them have been useful, while others were just flat-out heretical. But the canon is the list of those that God has given to the church by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Skeptics often say that the early church was divisive, and as time passed, one version of Christianity won out over the other types. The winners then decided which books would be authoritative, and of course, they chose the books that agreed with them. It's also often claimed that the church simply decided which books to include in the New Testament centuries after Jesus and the apostles had left the scene. Now this is silly because this implies that Jesus and the Holy Spirit had absolutely nothing to do with it. It was all strictly men. But it's important to note that church leadership did not decide which books to include in the canon as much as they attempted to discover which books God had actually given to the church and should therefore be included. When attempting to determine which books were inspired, the early church had three primary requirements. One was apostolic authority. And as we saw earlier with uh, Paul, Christ gave the apostles the task of preserving his teaching and taking it to the world. For a book to be included in the canon, it had to be linked to an apostle or to someone who had seen the risen Jesus and heard his teaching in person. That's a pretty narrow parameter. Some of the books were written by apostles directly. <clears throat> Matthew, John, and Peter all wrote books included in the canon. The gospel according to Mark is said to have been based on the preaching of Peter. Luke wrote Luke and Acts based on eyewitness accounts and first-hand documents. He was also a traveling companion of the apostle Paul and experienced many of the events in Acts firsthand. James and Jude were written by the half-brothers of Jesus who were not believers during Jesus' lifetime. But Jesus appeared to his brother James after the resurrection, and he became a believer. Uh, it's not reported for Jude, but you can safely assume he didn't believe in him beforehand. He probably saw him afterwards. Um, Jesus appeared to Paul directly and commissioned him to be an apostle. <clears throat> now, there were other books that may have been helpful to Christians, but if they did not have the apostolic connection, they were rejected as non-canonical. Some books were written in the name of an apostle, but if it was evident he did not actually write it or it went against something they knew was written by that person, the book was rejected. So if you had writings by Peter, you knew Peter wrote it, and it's following along with the theme of the New Testament, and then you have something else that comes up that says Peter read it and it, it wrote it, and it actually contradicts what we have that we knew Peter wrote, you can safely say Peter didn't write that and throw it out. It was very detailed on how we got our canon. The next was orthodox doctrine. There were many early documents that claimed to teach Christian doctrine but were in error. Much of the New Testament was written to combat these errors. Any document that contradicted the accepted teaching of the apostles was rejected. 
The apostles' teaching was transmitted orally for years before the New Testament as we know it existed. Oral transmission within cultures that practice it has been shown to be very, very accurate. Not like that silly telephone game we play sometimes. So basically, did the book contain consistency of doctrine and orthodox teaching? The third was broad-based acceptance. There were a number of other books that may have been helpful and doctrinally correct and were used by portions of the church in various locations, but to be considered canon, it had to have the broad-based acceptance and recognition of its nature across the Christian world. Letters written by Paul to churches in Asia Minor were saved, copied, and circulated all over the civilized world, and Christians all over the world recognized their authoritative nature. Now, that's what we would expect if God was actually in charge of the process, right? If he's not going to let the, the gates of hell come against the church, he's not going to let his word fall into disrepair. And then finally, did the book also bear evidence of the high moral and spiritual values that would reflect the work of the Holy Spirit? As these tests were applied, 27 books began to emerge. For a while, there were some doubts or disputes about a book here and there. But the 27 books of the New Testament that are accepted today were the ones that emerged from the application of this process and these guidelines. As this canon emerged, various councils and synods gave formal acknowledgement to what the church had already come to recognize. So this is like a, a, a literary, you, you say this is a literary uh, masterpiece. Uh, whatever novel you want or whatever old movie or whatever it is. Okay, nobody got together and said, oh, this is Tom Sawyer's a literary masterpiece. No, it just became that way over time and people came to recognize it. These churches and synods didn't say, this is the canon. No, the canon was already there. They just gave their approval and their seal to it. Like, yes, this is what we believe. This is the Christian life. Uh, at first, these books were maintained as separate works, generally written in Greek and copied thousands of times. <clears throat> the Bible was translated, as it uh, finally was, into Latin, Aramaic, and other languages. For the New Testament, the process of the recognition and collection began in the first centuries of the church. Very early on, very early, within years, parts of the New Testament were already being recognized as the Word of God. Paul considered Luke's writings to be authoritative, as authoritative as the Old Testament. You see it in 1 Timothy 5.18 and Luke 10.7. Peter recognized Paul's writings as Scripture in 2 Peter 3.15. And this is good, big because Peter and Paul were not the best friends. They butted heads. They had issues. But Peter said, hey, this guy is speaking the words of Christ. He said, this is Scripture that he's given you. Um, some of the books of the New Testament were being circulated among the churches uh, in Colossians 4.16 and 1 Thessalonians 5.27. Clement of Rome mentioned at least eight New Testament books in A.D. 95. Ignatius of Antioch acknowledged about seven books in A.D. 15. This is just scant years after Jesus' death. Polycarp, who was a disciple of John the Apostle, acknowledged 15 books in A.D. 108. Uh, Arrhenius mentioned 21 books in A.D. 155. Uh, Hippolytus recognized 22 books in A.D. 170. Uh, it just, the Synod of Laodicea in 363 forbade the use of several non-canonical books that people were using. Um, so you see that people were recognizing what was Scripture already. If they were followers, I like the way Paul put it, of the way they were recognizing already what was doctrinal and what wasn't. The Council of Hippo, not Potamus, just Hippo, 393, stated that the 27 books in the New Testament were canon. Uh, the Synod of Carthage in 397 stated that only the canon books should be read in the churches, and it listed, once again, the 27 books of the New Testament. And the Council of Carthage, 419, reaffirmed the existing canon. So, so we accept by faith that the canon is correct nowadays. But it's not to be blind faith. You need to know. You need to have that firm foundation under you. And that was what my, my journey was, to find out... I, 
I thought it was true. I hoped it was true, even though there was stuff I didn't agree with, right? But I wanted to know it was true. And I found out before, without a shadow of a doubt, it is true. Um, let's see. The Bible itself is self-authenticating. It's the only book with supernatural confirmation to support its claim of God-inspired. The testimony of Christ, the fulfillment of the prophecies. If you want to be blown away, just study the prophecies of Christ. There is no way those could have been fulfilled without God inspiring it. It is really, really amazing. Uh, the Bible is God-breathed, written by over 40 authors over the course of 1,500 years in three different continents. There were many different circumstances held by the people writing it. Some wrote from prison. Some wrote from palaces. Some wrote during times of war, times of sorrow. Some wrote from a desert. But the Bible remains unified in its message and has archaeological evidence backing it up. Bible critics have often been embarrassed by discoveries that corroborate the Bible accounts they had previously deemed to be myth, such as the existence of the Hittites, King David, and Pontius Pilate. In the field of prophecy, none of the Bible's predictions have been proved wrong. None. Just take Jehovah's Witnesses. They can't even get the arrival of Christ coming back right. What, seven times and they kept losing people so they just finally put it off? I mean, none of the prophecies have been proven wrong. For example, the Bible predicted the rise and fall of empires like Greece and Rome in Daniel 2.39. History later records that happening. Isaiah 23 tells of the coming destruction of the cities of Tyre and Sidon hundreds of years before it came to pass. The Bible tells of Caiaphas, the high priest who had Jesus put on trial. Guess what? Workers... Building a road found the tomb and remains of Caiaphas in a limestone ossuary just outside the old city of Jerusalem. The Bible mentions King Cyrus the Great in Isaiah, 2 Chronicles and Ezra. His tomb was discovered in Iran. Drawings or statues of 12 people mentioned in the Old Testament have been discovered, including King Jehu of Israel mentioned in 2 Kings 9, the Egyptian king Shishank mentioned in 1 Kings, the Egyptian pharaoh Turkana mentioned in 2 Kings 19.9, Xerxes I, the king of Persia in the book of Esther, uh, Pharaoh Hophra mentioned in Jeremiah 44.30, Haziel, king of Iran, 1 Kings 19, King Misha of Moab, speaking of in 2 Kings 3.4, and King Assyria Sargon II mentioned in 2 Kings. Archaeologists have discovered many structures and places that the Bible told about, many that people thought were non-existent. They have excavated Nebuchadnezzar's palace in Babylon, Israel's royal palace in Samaria, the Pool of Siloam in Jerusalem, Jacob's Well, Nehemiah's Wall, Solomon's City of Tadmor, temples to Dagon, the god of the Philistines, the amphitheater at Ephesus, the victory steel inscription with eight kings listed, including King David, the Valley of Megiddo, Hezekiah's Tunnel, Hezekiah's Walls, the city of Jericho, the Pool of Gibeon, the city gate of Gezer, the tombs of David and Solomon, mention of Balaam the prophet, the son of Boar, in Ammonite ruins, a Tel Dan inscription describing a battle between Haziel, king of Aram, and the kings of Judah and Israel, and the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. All of this stuff the Bible talked about and history said that didn't exist. When the ruins of Sodom and Gomorrah were excavated southeast of the Dead Sea, evidence that the site is consistent with the biblical account because the destruction debris was three feet thick, and guess what? The buildings were burned from fires that started on the top. If you don't know the story, God sent down fire and brimstone from heaven and burned the city. In discovering the walls of Jericho in the 1930s, John Garstang discovered that the walls fell suddenly and outwardly, not inwardly like a siege would produce, which is just what the Bible said so the Israelites could climb over the ruins. In 1906, the Hittites were unknown outside of the Old Testament. Scholars mocked the Bible for talking about the Hittites. And critics claimed they were a figment of biblical imagination. But digging east of Ankara, Turkey, they discovered the ruin of Hattusas, the ancient Hittite capital, as well as its vast collection of Hittite historical records, which showed an empire flourishing in the mid-second millennium B.C., what do they like to say today? Follow the science. Follow the stinking science. 
The Bible's right. Another historical fact that truth has been proven is the fact that Abraham had encounters with the Hittites in Genesis. And historians had long pointed to the mention of them together as a reason the Bible couldn't be trusted because they thought the Hittites didn't even come around until hundreds of years after Abraham died. But recent finds confirm the Bible's accounts that the Hittites actually predate Abraham by several centuries. Imagine that. Luke's account in the Gospel of Luke and the book of Acts contain numerous geographical and historical references. Every archaeological dig in that area finds evidence that without fail supports Luke's accounts. Governors mentioned by Luke that historians never believed existed were confirmed by the evidence uh, excavated by historian uh, Sir William Ramsey's team. Without a single error, Luke was accurate in naming 32 countries, 54 cities, and 9 islands. Ramsey was a skeptic who became so overwhelmed with the evidence that he converted to Christianity. He followed the science. It was once claimed there was no Assyrian king named Sargon, as recorded in Isaiah 21, because this name was not known in any other record. Then his palace was discovered in Iraq. The very event mentioned in Isaiah 20 that he captured Ashdod was recorded on the palace walls. In 2 Kings 18:19, the prophet Isaiah told of Hezekiah, told Hezekiah that God would protect Judah and Jerusalem against uh, Sennacherib after he conquered the ten northern tribes of Israel. Assyrian records confirm this. You know, it always amazes me how they'll believe records from every other civilization except for Christianity, except for Israel. It's like if the Old Testament says something, you can't believe it until something else secular says, oh, well, then this happened. Oh, well, then you can add that one to it. They'll do anything to disprove the Bible because they don't want to believe it. Uh, the cuneiform on a clay prism found at the Assyrian capital of Nineveh, describes his invasion of Judah in 701 B.C., and it claims that the Assyrian king shut Hezekiah inside Jerusalem like a caged bird, but it states that um, he did not conquer Jerusalem, just like the biblical record said. In fact, the Syrians bypassed Jerusalem on their way to Egypt. Daniel 5 tells about Belshazzar, the king of Babylon. Historians have always doubted this account because according to recorded history, the last king of Babylon was Nabadonius. The tablets were found showing that Belshazzar was actually his son and served as co-regent. Now what's interesting about that, that means he could actually offer to make Daniel the third highest ruler in the kingdom behind himself and his father, just like Daniel 5.16 said. The foundation of the synagogue at Capernaum where Jesus cured a man with unclean spirit in Mark 1.21 and delivered the sermon on the bread of life in John 6.25 has been excavated. Also the theater at Ephesus where the riot of the silversmiths occurred in Acts 19.29. And there's, there's many, many more. And I believe if you go on to the notes for the sermon, I've got more in there. The worship team can make its way up here. Um, there, there's victories, there's battles, there's kings over and over that the Bible talks about that we're steadily finding through excavations is true, is true, is true. After 40 authors, 66 books, 60 generations, 1,600 years, three languages, hundreds of controversial topics, beginning to end, zero contradictions. If you think you have a contradiction in the Bible, bring it to me. I'll be glad to disprove it. See, God isn't scared of our questions. God isn't scared of us searching. He wants us to search. He wants us to ask questions because truth is truth. He's not going to be proven wrong. And, and it gets me how people, historians, will take some ancient history that has a, a half of a page, one half of a page, and say this was true. And then you have the Bible that has been proven 98% accurate from historians. 
from what we find in Dead Sea Scrolls, from, from other writings we find. And the, the only inaccuracies have nothing to do with doctrine. It's words translated wrong or misspelling or maybe a little different meaning back then from what it means today. But nothing dealing with doctrine. But they want to throw that out. We have more documentation for the accuracy of the Bible than anything else written in the history of the world. That's where the authority of Scripture comes in. That's what you can rest your eternal soul on. But if you search that and you find that the Bible is true, there are no contradictions. The Bible prophesied things and told of things that we're just now finding out were true and that it is the Word of God be careful because then you have to decide are you going to live your life by that very Word of God or are you going to try to twist it and turn it to say things that it doesn't really say to suit whatever lifestyle you want to pursue it's better for you to just throw it out and go do what you want to do eat, drink and be married because if you believe this is truth, then you have to follow it. And we've given you the evidence that God's Word is God's Word. And then we have to follow what His apostles wrote, what canon was set before us. And if you have questions and you still want to search, that's not to say you can't question the authority. Question it. Go do the research on it. It did more to strengthen my faith than anything else in my life to question and say, is this really the Word of God? Because I found out for myself it's the Word of God. There's nothing you can say that's going to change my mind. I will not be swayed by differing winds of doctrine. I will not be swayed by the, the eloquent words of man. I know that this is the Word of God. Now it's on me what I do with that. But we're here to show you that you can rest in the rock of truth, not shifting sands of truth. So go ahead and stand with us. We'll close out with worship. I love you, Lord. Oh, your mercy never fails me all my days. I've been held in your hands From the moment that I wake up Until I lay my head I will sing of the goodness of God
all my life. All my life you have been trust it. So thank you for the gift of your word to us. Every word that you've given us is life. And so we trust you today, Jesus, as our Savior, as our King, as our Lord, as the word who came and dwelt among us. And so uh, we just give you the praise. And God, even as a part of our worship, which you, your word tells us, invites and commands us to participate in for the good of your people and the glory of your name, we give our tithes and offerings today. So we ask that you just take what we give First of all, let how we give not be out of obligation, but out of gratitude. Uh, and then take what we give and use this for your glory, for your kingdom to be, to be made here, and to be grown. So thank you for your provision for us. And we bless you today, Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen. Well, hey, God bless you this week. Have a great week. And we look forward to worshiping with you again next Sunday.